Good afternoon. I'm going to be very brief. You came here to listen to our guests, not me. With us, we have Neil Borden. He is the co-founder of Spicy Bills, and uh, he is the developer and um, work in, works in the process of developing uh, his own projects. Recently, he produced the rate. We are going to speak about this um, later. And um, with him, you have Alex Alexandro Angulo, who is uh, director of photography, producer of Labyrinth Productions, and he has worked in movies like Bluff, Society of the Streetlight, uh, Illegal.com, and uh, San Andresito. So Alessandro is beginning. Thank you very much, Santiago. It's good to see you here. It's good to see uh, new faces and old faces. Uh, welcome, Nate. Welcome to Colombia. As I s uh, as he said, he worked in uh, that movie with the name The Raid, second part. The interesting thing of this movie is not just a sequence of movies, but also the possibilities to make a remake and many things that have come from here. And that began with a movie that was a very small one, uh, the first part that was made in Indonesia. I would like that we begin right now um, seeing the trailer and uh, we can uh, talk over uh, talk uh, um, and the time is very short so basically i would like that we are uh, centered in the work of nail and through his work in the world we could understand how colombia should move and learn and change in order to produce um, film industry that can uh, travel throughout the world. This is a movie that uh, they are movies that travel and that's what he does internationally. Okay, let's go ahead with the trailer. Jangan lupa bersenang-senang.
Uh, Neil is going to tell us about his experience with the raid and uh, he's going to talk about the, his experience on this and what is the film uh, in around the world in Indonesia. Uh, let's uh, begin maybe the movie of Jenner uh, that we have seen here in Colombia but a uh, little bit, very little in which you could, we could see that the brothers Orozco, they have been the um, undisputable um, leaders of these movies in the last years. Uh, even though in the history of Colombia we have seen in different uh, situations in different periods. Neil, what do you think? So the definition of genre isn't very clear. However, you know, we love genre movies. And so the best way that we sort of talk about genre movies amongst ourselves are um, exciting, uh, entertaining movies that are usually action, uh, thriller, science fiction. But genre can be comedy. It can be uh, even drama. But I think that what makes genre different than, say, just a regular drama or a comedy is that there's something fantastical about it. There's something that is a bit different. And what we tend to focus on is genre that has a chance at theatrical uh, exhibition. So for us, even in the new age of digital media, we want to work on genre movies that have a chance to be seen around the world uh, in various different countries, but as a theatrical experience. And that might just be film festival related, or it might be in traditional cinemas. But we can say that genre uh, travels more because it's more easy to identify than other times of films? So the, why, why it travels more? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, as you know, one of the things there, the, one of the tricky things about uh, dramas and comedies from regions around the world is they can become very localized in a specific culture, in a specific uh, style that only that particular country or region would be able to understand. What makes genre unique as a general sense, in a general sense, is that it can be experienced outside of that local country that it was made because of the type of movie that it is. If, if The Raid is an action movie or a martial arts movie, you don't have to necessarily understand anything about Jakarta, Indonesia or the Indonesian society at all to completely understand the story of The Raid. And I think that's the trick with genre. Which is the case of The Raid, no? In the case of The Raid, Es la historia de un de un pelotón de policías. That's the story of um, a SWAT team that comes to take control of a building in which you have some mafioso uh, people, and then from there you only have a lot of problems, problems that are solved thank you to the special attitude of these uh, policemen. But taking uh, the example of what we were speaking about. Uh, on the raid, let's take, let's uh, speak a little bit about how the raid works and how it worked. So, and we can talk about the raid specifically, but action films in general uh, are seen all over the world. So Hollywood makes action movies every year. These movies are distributed all over the world, and including in Colombia and you can go to the Cineplex and, and enjoy them. And what The Raid essentially is, is in many ways, um, it simulates a lot of the traditional Hollywood uh, sensibilities when it comes to action, except that what makes it unique is that it is Indonesian, sure. which gives it a bit of a, an exotic feel to it, in addition to the fact that it's action. The easiest sense is that when you have buildings exploding and people shooting guns, this is just breaking it down to the common denominator. But that is something that allows the film to travel. And right now, I would say, as a sales agent, in addition to being a producer, is that action films do generally appeal to most of the world uh, compared to other genres of film, just because it's something that the target audience uh, for films in each country are comfortable going to see. So, of course, because this film was action-packed, we could cut a trailer that made the film look appealing no matter what the country is and that helps make it travel. Ahora, lo de una como the Raid uh, the y interesting thing about a movie like The Raid and other movies that uh, uh, he's done, they go to many festivals. 
So let's see up to what point the festival have been important for the traveling of these movies around the world. Los festivales. Film seen and promoted. Uh, one of the things that we as producers try to strive for is to have our films uh, premiere at a major international film festival, which is also in many ways a film market. So some of the biggest film festivals around the world, such as uh, Berlin, Cannes, even Toronto, these film festivals are also acting very much, they're very much also a market. And so for us to be able to premiere a movie like The Raid at Toronto, it gives it a couple different senses of credibility. One, if an action movie from Indonesia is at Toronto, that means there's a stamp of approval that's been given to the film. So that when international distributors from all over the world have come to the festival to, to screen movies, that's unique. Because usually, most of these festivals strive at showing art house movies, which is fine, but we feel like we've made an art house action movie. You know, there's something that's different and, and fresh about the way in which the movie was shot. The, uh, the martial arts is something that's never been seen before on film before. And so there were things about it that were fresh. So film festivals are crucial to positioning the movie to the marketplace as a film that is globally uh, demanded. So for us, going to a film festival gives it the credibility of being um, a classy film. And at the same time, gives it a platform so that when distributors come to watch the movie theatrically with an audience, they recognize that the film has a chance to be seen in their local markets, perhaps even theatrically. Uh, you may think that the movies of Jenner are impossible in a festival. The idea is to come to the public and on the other side to use the festival not just to uh, reach to more audience, but also to have a better distribution internationally. So uh, really, it's a doubt about how to make these kind of films in which the uh, Nailis is expert of this. Um, and at the same time, he can participate in the festivals. So most, uh, most film festivals around the world, and this isn't just the big ones, have created specialized programs and sections to support and promote genre movies. And I guess sometimes they're called midnight movies because they're more often to be experienced at night because of the, the violence or the horror or whatever. But if you, if you look at each of the major film festivals, even Cannes, there are designated sections for midnight movies or for genre films. And so those have become kind of like the, the crown jewels or the, the holy grail for a genre filmmaker is to have not only your film get into a festival, but to get it into that section, um, it's, it's very important. So when we, when we identify a film project that we're going to do, we very much think about the, the, post -produ the production and the post-production schedule. And we imagine when will this film be completed and what would be the best festival launch for the movie? What, whether it be later in the year, or earlier in the year, that gives us a, a general sense of what festival we're going to be targeting. After the film has had its profile world premiere, there are various other specialized genre festivals around the world. There's, um, they're everywhere. I mean, throughout Europe and Asia. I mean, there's Sitges in Spain is probably one of the most famous and the oldest of film festivals where Quentin Tarantino goes and shows all of his movies. Uh, they have them really in almost every country. And that's a good way to further establish that your film is a quality genre movie that can play everywhere. One of the most important things of The Raid is a, is a movie that could be filmed in anywhere, could have been filmed in Colombia, should, uh, why Indonesia, and uh, uh, while you that he, you, you have uh, filmed several times in Colombia. Uh, let's see the experience of filming here, or if a movie like The Raid could be done in Colombia or not, uh, what is missing here in order to have these international movies.
We used to we used to joke when we developed the RAID as a as an Indonesian project. We used to joke that the RAID 2 could be the RAID 2 Bogota, the RAID 3 could be RAID 3 um, Rio. The, the the reality is that um, there's nothing about this film that's too specific to Indonesia, except that the martial arts in the film, its origin is primarily of Indonesia and Philippines and South Asia. So there is something unique to Indonesia, but you would never know. I mean, there's nothing about it that's alienating. We, first and foremost, uh, designed the raid with uh, our local partner and director, who's a Welsh, uh, a Welsh man living in Indonesia, and he has a company that's Indonesian. And we, we looked at it from a business standpoint as a movie that could recoup the cost of making the film in Indonesia alone. So we knew that at the very least, based on the actors that were in it, uh, based on the budget that we, we could commit to spend, that if the film just turned out mediocre, at least for the local market in Indonesia, which is primarily theatrical box office revenues. Like here. Yes, like here. Yeah. Uh, that we could make our money back. And that any international distribution deals that we could do for the film would be pure profit. Okay. So the movie was designed as an Indonesian movie first, as an international movie second, but it was developed creatively as an international film. And what kind of budget are we talking about? We made the movie for a little bit under one million U.S. dollars on 73 days of oh. physical production. Incredible. And so that gave us all the need, you know, the time to be able to sequence out and pull off the action and the martial arts scenes for the film. But that is the, that budget was exactly what it needed to be in order to break even in Indonesia if the film did not sell anywhere else around the world. Oh, great. That's really we good. chose Indonesia because of the partner. We didn't pick Indonesia because it was cheap. We didn't pick Indonesia because we wanted to go to Indonesia. Uh, there was a filmmaker there that we were very excited about. We're a very filmmaker-driven company. We're filmmaker-driven across the board. So after seeing his previous work, we spent more time talking about what he wanted to do next. We started talking about the future, the future of not just Indonesian filmmaking, but global filmmaking, and building a partnership. And finding a way to make more movies in Indonesia with the start of this film. And so it was a very conscious effort to partner with somebody that we believed in and relied on as a partner, but also a filmmaker we wanted to be in business with for years. And that is the reason why we went to Indonesia, and it's the same reason why we've been coming to uh, Colombia and some other countries around the world. And tell us a little bit more about your experience here in Colombia. I mean, because it's, I mean, you've been here several times. So this is actually my very first time in Colombia personally, uh, but my company, um, which I'm a partner in, has been spending some time in the region. Um, we've been a part, now, a part of uh, two productions as producers, uh, one of which is uh, Saluda al Diablo uh, by uh, Los Orozco's brothers. Uh, we acted as not only an executive producer to, to help with uh, the international financing, but also as the international sales agent. So we actually were the company that went out and licensed the distribution rights around the world, and we sold several territories uh, for that film. And then we just wrapped production on a movie called uh, Aguas Rojas, which is also called Out of the Dark, which we just did here as a Spanish-Colombian co-production, a co-production between Dinamo and um, Apaches in Spain, the company that did The Impossible and The Orphanage. And it was in partnership with uh, our company in the United States and a company called Participant Media. And that was a supernatural ghost story um, starring Julia Stiles and Scott Speedman. And the experience was very good. So now, as you know, we're, we're having another project uh, that we've been completing the development on called um, La Escriba de Uraba, or the scribe, <clears throat> the scribe of Uraba. La Escribana de Uraba. And that is a project uh, that we're doing with uh, Will Smith's company, Overbrook. And it's a uh, uh, brother's named um, the Zimbalist Brothers, who did a movie called The Two Escobars, which was a documentary. Okay, great. 
Eh, ya estamos listos para ver el siguiente tráiler. Quiero que veamos una we película. We'd like to see the next trailer. Uh, we would like to see one movie that we did in Mexico, and we are what uh, is there. ¿Qué vamos a hacer? Tienes que tomar el lugar de papá. De ahora en adelante yo decidiré lo que va a ser la familia. Yo no te tengo miedo. Pues deberías. en riesgo a la familia, Alfredo. Pues esto les va a pasar si se vuelven a acercar a mi familia. So we, we we picked this movie as an example to show you because it's um, it's a Mexican film. It was made in Mexico for very little money by a filmmaker named Jorge Grau, and uh, the story very simply is about a family of cannibals trying to survive, but at the same time uh, keep their secret, um, you know, keep their secret confidential. And there's a conflict that arises, and our protagonist, being one of the young boys in the family, trying to figure out how to save his family at the same time, you know, coexist in normal society. And at its core, this is a movie about family. This is a movie about you know traditional values and trying to maybe as an outsider uh, exist in a traditional society. Mm -hmm. But on the surface, this is a cannibal horror genre movie. And as you probably noticed from the Laurels, the film world premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. So there's something about this, the, the filmmaking and the storytelling that allowed this film to be different than your average horror film. That's something that we recognized in this director, and it's something that we recognized in the ability to, um, for this film to find distribution all over the world. Now, we didn't handle this movie for distribution, uh, but uh, this film was sold pretty much everywhere by another sales agent and the film performed pretty well. But for a film that cost very little money, it made a lot of its money uh, in international distribution deals. And it's a story that came 100% from Mexico. For a Correct, and uh, we're developing a movie with this director now, which we're going into production on early next year, which is actually a werewolf movie. Um, it's a similar th thematic sort of story dealing with a family and a father and his son, but um, That movie will also be in Spanish and will also be shot completely in Mexico. So, f uh, you know, Nate, for we producers, uh, Mexico is uh, our competing. Usually, I mean, in the region, we are competing against them uh, for productions. I mean, not, not only productions that are originally from our country, but also services and so on. Uh, what do you see in Mexico? That, is, that, that it was so attractive, besides the story? The filmmaker. It, it comes back to being obsessed with the director, and whether or not everyone agreed with us or not, we felt very strongly that this is a director that is, one, going to make great movies in his country, which we could be supportive of, which could become remakes. That movie, by the way, I should say, was just recently uh, remade and it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival where it sold for seven figures, over a million dollars. 
And that director is now going to be doing a prequel to that film as well. So as you could see, this was a story that had universal appeal. And then to answer your question more specifically and more directly, there was nothing about Mexico as a country that, that uh, drew us to it. Uh, it was very specifically this filmmaker, his ambitions to tell stories that have the chance to travel all around the world. In, that was the case of uh, uh, the film from the Orozco brothers that you just financed. I mean, you saw that in that film. What, what did you see in, the, in Salud al Diablo de mi Parte? Yeah, Salud al Diablo de mi Parte, it, um, it was a very simple concept. You know, a father's you know, daughter has been kidnapped. He had a very dirty past. His past has come back to haunt him. And now he has 72 hours to track down the various people that he worked with, kill them in order to save his daughter's life. It doesn't get any more simple, you know, it's a very simple concept. Sure. So for us, that's very appealing because uh, that's, a, that's a, the kind of story and a kind of movie that somebody in the United States or somebody in Europe or somebody in Asia could sit down and not necessarily feel like the language barrier is standing in the way of their ability to be entertained by a film like that. And uh, talking about remakes, I mean, The Raid is going to be also remaked, no? Some, some movies, uh, first off, uh, we, remakes are a big part of, of what we do. Um, the Raid was developed as an Indonesian language movie with an eye towards eventually being remade. But that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be an English remake. We could have easily decided to go make a Spanish language remake of the movie as well. In this particular case, because the movie was so popular and, and very successful, you know, we had the opportunity to make a studio deal in the United States, so we'll be producing that remake with Sony Screen Gems, but that'll be an American movie. We might have international cast in the film, but that is going to become a traditional Hollywood studio movie, not an independent film. Okay, great. So let's see the next trailer. No, vamos a ver el, el siguiente tráiler, por favor, que es de una película brasilera, Dos Conejos. joias lá, o caso dos judeus, pelo menos oito assassinatos, latrocínio, sequestro, por aí vai. Superfaturamento. Suborno. Aliciamento. Dinheiro na cueca. <risos> A Júlia tem uma pessoa aí na manga que pode ajudar. É. Pode ser que dê certo, pode ser que não dê certo. Mas o cara é deputado estadual. Dois milhões de reais, Jânio? Não, dólar. E o que, que você vai fazer com isso? O que, que eu vou fazer? Justiça. Mata dois coelhos com uma caixa d'água só. Lotado de grana que tá indo de um lugar pro outro assim. Que barulho é esse? Uma palma na mala. O quê? Que neguinho marrento.
Great animation job, eh? It looks fantastic. It, tell us about the travel of this film. What's interesting about this movie is that it doesn't travel as well as uh, The Raid or even We Are What We Are, but uh, the film is a calling card for the director. That's the film that defines, in many ways, a signature from the filmmaker. It gets him noticed by uh, people like us, by um, agencies that represent filmmakers in the United States. He was very quickly signed as a, as a director by the United Talent Agency. He is now in production or going into production on um, a much larger film of $30 million budget with Anthony Hopkins and Colin Farrell. And then that film is also going to be remade. But that film travels, not as much. It's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more frenetic, kind of like, uh, you know, Guy Ritchie movies, you know? But at the same time, we got distribution for that movie in the United States. Uh, we re received a significant minimum guarantee because there's a, there is a way to market that film. And there's a way to also uh, dub the movie in Spanish as well as Portuguese. So you have this uh, film that, without a doubt, is going to do some business in Brazil. But now it's gotten the film noticed. It's gotten the filmmaker signed. He's now doing more movies. We got distribution for it in other countries. And now we're looking to do doing more with his company in Brazil, also bringing potentially projects to Brazil to make with him and his uh, stable of filmmakers. Great. Fantastic. And how do you compare... Mexico and Brazil with Colombia. How, how so? uh, I mean, in your experience, I mean, shooting those three countries, how do you compare Colombia, I mean, with Mexico and Brazil? We haven't actually made a film in Brazil, so I don't know, but um, in our experience, uh, Colombia is a fantastic option. There's great incentives. There are um, reliable partners in terms of production services, in terms of hospitality, in terms of, uh, you know, just being able to be compatible with uh, an international production, and the locations. So you add all of these values up, and from a financial standpoint, it's very, uh, it's attractive to be able to come here and shoot versus, say, somewhere like Mexico, where the incentives are not as good. It's <clears throat> technically more dangerous, at least right now in terms of being able to attract actors and actresses and people and crew to be able to go there. One of the things that, that's fantastic about Colombia is that there's studio facilities, so there's actual um, opportunities to be able to um, you know, shoot here without it always just being an on-location uh, feature. And so for us, it's a, it's a very nice option. Uh, we always have to be very fiscally responsible. When we work with private investors in, in films, we have to present the options for shooting the film in various parts of the world based on the net cost to make the movie. So we run an analysis, and, but what, one of the things that we've found here is that we can partner with a company like Dinamo, we can partner with a company like uh, Johnny Torcha. Hendrickson and Torcha, like we are on Scribe. These are reliable partners that we know that can deliver movies. And so for us, that's the number one key. Is, is this, is this a, a partnership that is going to allow for us to make a good movie? And do you find appealing the Colombian stories in international level? I mean, what about the stories in general that you receive from Colombia? Very limiting. You know, for us, we haven't identified anything from Colombia that, <clears throat> that has a, a chance for us at least to, to take on international sales because very little opportunity for these films to find distribution in Europe and in Asia. So instead, you know, we've, we've looked to get more involved creatively with partners here to develop concepts that can one make sense for South America, for Colombia, Peru, Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, whatever, anywhere within this region, and at the same time have an ability to travel. But there's nothing outside of uh, Salud al Diablo that's really come to us but there's, there are projects that we haven't seen, so that doesn't make it that they don't exist, but we just haven't come across any. Okay. So let's see the trailer of uh, Easy Money, una película de Suecia.
Bueno, este es realmente el tráiler de Stung, que es, si no estoy mal, avispa en alemán, y es una película alemana. So, <laughs> we wanted to show you this because it brings up the topic of um, previs and financing. Exactly. Uh, so this this hasn't been made yet. This was just uh, promotional previsualization. Um, we shot this in less than two days. Um, it was really just a. It's not even in the movie. Um, I mean, it's a movie about a killer wasp, but. Um, we wanted to be able to finance this film with a first-time director from Germany, uh, which is a very challenging thing to do with the special effects that we required, and he's a very good special effects uh, expert. But in order to prove to financiers, international distributors, that we could make a movie like this um, for the budget that we were going to make it for, which is about $2 million, and we needed to be able to prove to them that we could. So what we did was we put together a finance plan uh, as a German co-production. So this is a movie that will be shot entirely in Germany, German filmmaker, German crew, mostly American cast. And uh, the finance plan was a big portion pre-sales. So for us to go out and actually collateralize and pre-sell the movie, I think we expected to do about almost a million dollars in pre-sales. Uh, so almost 50% of the budget. And so we shot that and we did it. So we start production in October in Germany and it'll be that director's first feature film, but we're a big fan of his previous uh, short form work. So for us, what we would do is with the filmmaker, uh, design a promotional device like that and go out and shoot it. And then as the sales agents, in addition to producing, go out and sell the international rights that we would want to be able to help finance the film. And it looks fantastic. Um, actually, you're trying to do something like the impossible. I mean, shoot an international film with American cast so that you get like a great international distribution. Yeah. And this is supposed to be a, fan, a fun movie. You know, this is, this is an action horror film. It's meant to be fun and entertaining, not taken too seriously. If any of you are big horror fans, we, we love the movie Tremors as, you know, one of our favorites, and we wanted to do something that was similar to that in tone. At the same time, we wanted to come up with uh, a concept that could be commercial and internationally viable, and a giant killer wasp terrorizing people um, without getting into the mythology of the wasp it's very interesting and it was something that we could sell. But note that this is not a movie that's automatically going to be a theatrical movie. We have to make a great movie. Mm, okay. we, have this, we have to go and get the film to a place where it goes to Toronto, sure. like The Raid, and has the, you know, the credibility of good reviews and people who, of the genre, who love the genre, recognize that it's a film that is better than all of the others. Sure. And uh, let's talk about financing. I mean, I mean, where is the money? Where is the money usually for the genre films? So the money's, you know, obviously still very much uh, in, in most parts of the world with, with the government, um, with banks. Um, there's still pre-sales out there to be done, but they become harder and harder unless uh, the film has something special about it. Um, oftentimes cast that make the film commercial. And then of course there's private sources of funding from investors who invest for a living and high net worth individuals who are looking to diversify their portfolio into m media because of the, the return on investment is attractive even though there's a lot of risk and that it's at times a very sexy opportunity to be able to get involved in creative arts, the movie business, things like that. But it's out there. I mean, with Stung, very simply, <clears throat> we've got funding from the general, uh, the German federal government. We've uh, excuse me, as a cash rebate. Yeah. You're talking about. Okay. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's called the DFFF. Um, it comes out to about 16% of the budget. Um, we have a German presale as part of the financing, which represents uh, about 10% of the budget. And then we have uh, other pre-sales from around the world, including in France, the UK, Canada, Australia. Um, the same distributor in Australia that released The King's Speech is releasing this movie in Australia. Um, but that's how we do it. And then there is some source of sometimes small equity, cash. Mm -hmm. yep. And then we would work with uh, a lender, somebody who would 
you know, lend against any contracts that we have. Okay, great. Sounds great. Eh, ahora veamos el siguiente corto, ahora sí la película sueca, Easy Money. Spelare. Jag förstår dig. Det känns som att du upplever allt här för första gången. Är det bra eller dåligt? Jag vill bara lägga ner det där. Vad menar du? Jag menar bara att lika barn läcker bäst. Vem är det som har garderoben? Kan du hämta han? Du blir inte intresserad. Det spelar ingen roll. Hämta han som har garderoberna säger. Vi jobbar för Abdul Karim. Ni har gått ihop med Jorge för att ta in ett stort parti varor. Det här är en ny värld för dig, eller hur? Det är inte många som vet att den finns. Men det finns också en baksida. Och den är skogningslös givet. Du skulle inte tro att du känner dem du jobbar med. Jag har varit med länge. Och det som händer nu är att folk blir giriga och nervösa och bakom ryggen på varandra. I den här branschen tänker alla på sig själv och cashen i första hand. Det borde du också göra den här gången. Ha? Okay, Nate, tell us a little bit about your experience in shooting in, uh, in Sweden, but tell us about Sweden also. I mean, about what's going on with the film industry over there. I mean, because uh, we heard a lot about here in Colombia, like a huge uh, a revolution. So let's talk about that. Yeah, we wanted to show you this film. This is a, an example of a film from Sweden. Uh, this, in many ways, is a genre movie, but it's also very much just a drama. You know, it's a crime drama. It's something that you would have seen from an early Martin Scorsese. You deal in gang culture, but you deal with, you know, a young man who is trying to fit in with the upper echelon of society mm -hmm. and gets caught up with a criminal organization because he recognizes the ability to get rich quick to maintain that level of stature in society and gets caught up very much in a major dilemma. That, could be, that story could be told anywhere. There's nothing unique to Sweden or, De or Scandinavia about that story. And it became a, a recognized film because it went to Berlin. The director immediately went from making that film to making Safe House, the movie with uh, Ryan Reynolds and Denzel Washington. So you could see, made this movie, was signed by a major agency, United Talent Agency, and within you know, a short period of time, uh, was picked to direct um, you know, this bigger film. The reason why is because the director is very impressive. He is somebody that um, commands the set. He's great with actors. Um, you could put him in a room with even Denzel Washington, and he would uh, command respect. And at the same time, um, really great storyteller, and that's why Safe House was a great example. I think with the reason why we wanted to show this is because that director is a prototype I think there are a lot of similar directors in, in Latin America, and I'm sure in Colombia as well. And I think it's a good case study and a prototype of a movie that could be made in Colombia. You know, a, a thriller, it could involve crime or not, but the point is, is that very similar to Salud al Diablo, there's something about it that's quite commercial um, and appealing to a broad audience. And so for us, Scandinavia is doing this over and over again with Let the Right One In, Tomas Alfredson, then he does Tinker Taylor's Soldier Spy. Sure. Daniel Espinosa, who's now an A-list director from Sweden. Ole Bornedal from Denmark. And I think that what these filmmakers are doing is developing commercial concepts. Because they know that in Scandinavia, there's, for them to make a lot of money, they need to be able to make international movies. 
and they, they have uh, such a great um, track record that they look up to the next guy and said, well, that's how he did it, or that's how she did it, so let's, let's follow in their footsteps. And there are a dozen other examples from just the last five years of films from Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Norway, even Iceland with uh, Balthazar Kormaker who just did Contraband and Two Guns. These are, Scandinavia is a hotbed for this and it's been for a while and I feel like that there's no reason why um, Latin American culture of filmmaking can't also be very much um, following in that footsteps because I think that it gives you more recognition and it gives you a better chance of, of getting your story out there. It seems like uh, what they're trying to do really is to look for a broader market and they're succeeding, no? I mean, the ca it's the case of uh, Denmark, of uh, Korea, and Indonesia also, and, and, and Sweden, no? Uh, just to close our, our conversation and start with the questions, uh, what else can you tell us about how to get like an international audience possible? I think these are great examples to start with. You know, these are, these are ranging from very successful local movies uh, to films that were globally successful. <clears throat> and I believe that when you think about storytelling in general, just look at the canon of movie making. Not just American films, because none of these movies we should were American movies. None of them. So there's no reason why, you know, uh, when you're developing a concept with, you know, if you're a producer and you're thinking of great ideas and you have a filmmaker and or vice versa, there's a, there's a writer that you're starting to develop an idea with, I think it's important to watch international films and to spend time researching and studying, speaking to sales agents from around the world, speaking to, um, you know, other producers of movies like these, and trying to get a better sense of what went wrong and what went right. And I think that that's the only way for a film that's made in a specific country that ha has an opportunity now to be able to be seen and distributed in other countries around the world in different languages. Well, that's fantastic. Yo creo que podemos arrancar con las preguntas. ¿Cómo funciona? Hola. Bueno, vamos a empezar. We're going to begin our questions. We are being uh, transmitting through streaming. The people who want to intervene and to ask, uh, they should stand up and uh, they have to speak when the when they have the microphone. Who is the first person to speak here? And uh, we're going to see, uh, we are going to have uh, one question for, uh, me pregunto si. your post-production visual effects and sound in your movies? Are they done locally in the countries where the movies are filmed or are they done elsewhere? Everything that we've been doing has been done locally. <clears throat> so we rely almost entirely on local department heads and crew members in todos and nuestros socios. facilities. Now, there are ca cases where in terms of the financing, in terms of the partners that we have, whether the co-production is complex. So if it's more than one country, then we might end up doing, say, production here in Colombia, and then post-production special effects in Spain. So it just depends on the setup of the production. It depends a lot on where we're spending the money, because that will have an effect on what kind of incentives or rebates we might be able to take advantage of. And then for the very other obvious reason, it's because the talent that we're working with there just happens to be better. Um, it's very case by case. Okay, tenemos aquí. Uh, hi, I was wondering in the case of Stang, uh, that you did that previous, is that, you, that you, something that you normally do for all your projects or just in this case for the special effects? And in that case, how much money do you spend on that previous, knowing that it's not sure that's going to get done? That's a good question. Uh, the, in, the cases, in the case of Stung, it was an absolute requirement for two reasons. One, because the director was new. So we needed to convince uh, potential financiers and distributors that he was worth getting into business with. 
and because we believed in him and because we could show some work that he was able to do as a filmmaker, it made it easier. We don't do them for everyone, but we highly, highly recommend it, and we usually come up with various ways to still do it for a couple different reasons. One, because it's helpful to establish for the international marketplace early on what's happening with the movie. It gives us uh, more confidence going into production about what we're trying to do, and it gives us a, an opportunity to experiment. And when it comes to actual uh, budgeting for these things, I mean, we made this for nothing. You know, we, we utilized the support of crew that we were also going to use for the actual production. So the incentive was, if this works, then we have a chance to green light the movie, and then you will be our, you know, you'll be a part of making that movie as well. Everything is case by case, and sometimes there'll be a small amount of money that we can use as part of the finance. If the movie is already financed, we can budget it in in advance as part of uh, pre-production costs. Bueno, tenemos preguntas desde desde la red. Okay, entonces seguimos aquí en la sala con. Um, just following up with the first question a little bit. I mean, you're working locally with. Uh, with production and post-production house facilities, how do you manage to keep cohesion, or what challenges do you do you get to to maintain the quality of the film, especially working across several countries and several different cultures as well? Uh, I imagine you can get a lot of challenges doing that, but like it, it's a lot of traveling. It's a lot of um, it's establishing phenomenal um, streams of communication. You know. For us, more than anything, it's identifying a partner we can trust. And you don't know who you can trust until you try it, so there's a leap of faith. A lot of the time, it's based on previous projects that those companies have done. There's a track record, there's credibility. Um, oftentimes, it's just a matter of um, you know, taking some risk in many ways. And there's problems. There's always problems. Every movie has problems. Um, some are just bigger than others. And even on the raid, you know, there were issues. I mean, nothing major, no one ended up dying, but there were injuries. You know, you have, um, you have lots of risk that you're taking. And so I think that for us, it's just managing that risk. And we're, we're, my partners and I were always traveling around the world. We're not li in our offices in Los Angeles on Skype every day. We're actually going to these places and spending time and learning the culture and getting to know people in their local regions. And I, I think that gives us an opportunity to become smarter producers, right? To be able to develop projects not just as an American company, but also as an international company. Mm, bueno, una última pregunta aquí en la sala. I have a question. De, uh -oh. If you as a producer... Puedes ponerte de pie solamente para que nos vean. I'm sorry. If you, as a, as a producer, could go anywhere in the world to shoot, where would it be and why? <laughs> this is a loaded question, but I, I would love to go to Panama to make movies for a few different reasons. Uh, no, the... the I, very biased. Uh, the, the truth, the truth is, is that um, we just had a phenomenal experience in the Philippines. Uh, we were involved in a production there. It was something that we weren't physically on the, involved in on the ground producing, but um, we are going to make more movies in the Philippines uh, in, the, in the next 12 months. Probably two more movies in the Philippines. Um, I love the country, I love the culture, the ambition and the passion from the filmmakers there have been great, and uh, I, I, I intend to spend more time there. And then we'd really like to do something um, in Brazil. You know, it, it's, it's working with somebody like Alfonso Poyart, who did Two Rabbits, and finding a great project to shoot in Brazil. We've already done Colombia, and we're doing more, as you know. But uh, I think, again, Latin America and Asia are the two most exciting regions in the world right now for us, in terms of emerging filmmakers, great opportunities for production, and for us, just creatively speaking, um, it's a great place to make movies. It's very inspiring. Bueno, con esto cerramos este Okay, this is the end of this uh, talk.
and uh, we are continuing up to 4.30, so applaud him.